My energy story starts in 2002 when I traveled to Antarctica and got to know penguins. Now I'm not going to tell you all the great things that there are to know about penguins, but one area that you might be interested in, penguins have to travel hundreds of miles facing predators all the way to feed on fish and krill and then travel hundreds of miles back just to feed their chicks. They live in an incredibly cold environment and they have a high energy lifestyle. They get that energy by eating fish and krill and they use that energy for transportation and heat. Now in a lot of ways penguins are just like us. We have a high energy lifestyle. For example, we traveled to Antarctica in a big ship and had enough energy to even have a barbecue in the back deck. We get most of our energy by burning fossil fuels. We use that energy for transportation, heat, and of course electricity as well. On the way back from Antarctica, our expedition leader said, you know, our lifestyle might make Antarctica unlivable for these penguins. And I was devastated. Now look, this talk isn't about global warming. It's not about air pollution or water pollution, not about terrorist funding or political corruption. It is about 100% renewable energy. But 100% renewable energy will help with all of these areas, and there's even evidence that will help us with extreme weather, poverty, population, and clean water access. This talk is about 100% renewable energy leading to a lifestyle that's not just as good as what we have, but better, that's not just possible but likely, and the simple actions that all of us can take to make this change happen faster. And I didn't know any of that in 2002. What I knew was penguins eating fish and krill weren't going to hurt us, but our burning fossil fuels could hurt the penguins. And that switching to 100% renewable energy was one way that we could help the penguins. Now I know that I'm just one person that we really need to get everybody on the planet to make these changes. And not just the people that currently have high energy lifestyle, the places that are lit at night on the globe, but also the dark places as well, that we're talking about everybody on the planet. We believe to make this change we have to electrify transportation and heat, and that we must make our electricity renewably. So what can I do? The first thing I did was I started to talk to people. So one friend said, is there enough land to put all the solar panels on? And another friend said, what about the cost of doing this? And my dad said, can we really build enough panels and wind turbines? And my wife said, you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time. The wind doesn't blow all the time. Can we keep the lights on all the time? Well, in 2002, I didn't know the answers to these questions. But now it's 2014, and we actually have a pretty good idea of how to answer these questions. So let's start with enough land. We have a number of studies from Stanford and the World Wildlife Fund that say in most places we can have 100% renewables with less than 1% of the land. The World Wildlife Fund went on to say that we can have solar power in harmony with nature. Well, what does 1% of the land mean? In the United States, roads and parking lots make up 2 to 3% of the land. And we can use parking lots for solar. There's other places we can put solar that doesn't use up additional land. For example, in farmland, for some crops, you can put a checkerboard square of solar panels over the farmland. It'll actually increase crop yields. So it certainly looks like we can resolve the land issue. So let's talk about costs. Just the United States spends $1.2 trillion per year for traditional fossil and nuclear energy. Over 20 years, that's $24 trillion. That's one way to look at our budget. Our analysis showed that the United States could transition to 100% renewables for just 12 to 22 trillion dollars, saving trillions of dollars. That's for solar, wind, and transmission upgrades and energy storage, and we'll talk why those are important in a bit. So this is our analysis. Just recently, the International Energy Agency did its own analysis, and it showed that for the world, not the U.S., and 2050, not 2034, our 20-year goal, 
the cost to decarbonize our energy supply would be 44 trillion. The fuel savings would be 115 trillion. It certainly looks like we'll save trillions of dollars. What about, are there enough panels? Can we build what we need? Well, we actually calculated how many panels it would take to power the entire world's energy usage right now. And it's 2,500 million metric tons. Now, I don't know what that means. I know it's a big pile of panels, but I don't know if we can build that much. So how about if we compare this number to things that we currently manufacture? So there's our 2,500 million metric tons of solar panels in yellow. Let's compare that to, say, 20 years of iron production. We make a lot more iron than we'll need of solar panels. Well, what are solar panels made out of? And it turns out mostly aluminum and glass. Now the raw materials for aluminum and glass are abundant, but we think we'll actually have to have modest growth in aluminum and glass manufacturing, say 7% a year, but only for 10 years, not for 20 years. So it certainly looks like we can make enough panels. What about keeping the lights on? Now we know that wind and solar are variable. They don't stay constant all the time. And we know we want to keep the lights on all the time. Now remember when we talked about transmission upgrades and energy storage? Well, the reason for these is for this variability issue. Now, I think most people understand that energy storage, like batteries, on a very big scale, will help with variability. What's this transmission upgrade about? When we talk about transmission, we're talking about moving electricity over hundreds or thousands of miles. So how does that help us? Well, here's a map of what the winds look like on Monday over the United States. The United States is outlined in white, and the wind is shown in green lines. Well, on Monday, that's a great place to put a wind farm. But on Tuesday, might not be much wind right there. So if we have a wind farm there, well, if we connect the two with transmission, that will help a lot with the variability of the wind. And we can do the same thing with solar. When it's sunny on the west coast, it might be nighttime on the east coast. If we connect all of these, this helps with variability. So really, variability is not much of a problem. What is a problem with renewable energy is that you have excess electricity at certain times. This dark blue in this graph, that's excess electricity from just 20% renewables. And like Mae West said, too much of a good thing can be wonderful, at least for electricity consumers. So let's use electric cars as an example. They're fun to drive, and if you haven't driven one, we strongly recommend you do. They are great fun. And as another example of how our lifestyle will improve, I don't know anybody that loves to go to the gas station to fill up, and we won't have to go to gas stations anymore for gasoline. Plus, there's a huge cost savings. When we fill up with gasoline, it's 370 a gallon. When we fill up with average electricity costs in the United States, it's just 90 cents a gallon equivalent of electrons. What's more is we can charge our electric vehicles with wind and solar. We think that the three of these together, fun to drive and dollar savings, and wind solar charging is going to lead to rapid adoption of electric vehicles. So remember, we were talking about there being too much of a good thing. Well, when you have too many shoes, what do you do? Well, you put them on sale. We think that's exactly what's going to happen with excess electricity. When we have too much wind or solar, that'll be on sale. It'll be 50 cents a gallon to charge up. And in fact, that 50 cents a gallon, that's actual wind prices from 2013, plus paying for the electricity grid and taking out all subsidies. And in fact, there are examples from Texas where they have a lot of wind power right now, where late at night you can charge your electric vehicle for free. So we think that with transmission upgrades and energy storage, we'll be able to keep the lights on. We talked about penguins in 20 years. Let's talk about this 20-year issue. Really, the future is in our hands. And we can look back 20 years at something like for example, cell phones. That's what cell phones looked like 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, less than half a percent of the planet, that's that little bitty green line on our planet, actually had cell phones. 
Now, in 2014, 95% of the people on the planet have cell phones. And cell phones look like this. That's just 20 years of change. And nothing about renewable energy is different than cell phones in our ability to make them and get them out to people on the planet. What we think is going to happen is a new kind of energy independence. This is a map of the footprints of all the buildings in the city where I live. The small yellow dots, those are the footprints of homes, and the big yellow dots, footprints of businesses. We think that energy independence is going to look like solar everywhere on rooftops and in parking lots, energy storage everywhere. This picture is a battery that Tesla Motors plans to manufacture for residences, and here's one that they plan for businesses. We'll have plug-in cars everywhere, wind and transmission upgrades where it makes sense, solar heating, geothermal, tidal, and other renewables where they make sense, and we really don't need any new fossil power plants right now. We can just have the old ones and only run a few hours a year when we run out of renewables and storage. So what can I do to make this energy independence happen? We've put together a short video of simple actions that millions of people are taking, and you can get to that by clicking here. Now, of course, you've been watching our introduction. For those that want it, we put together a video that has a lot more detail here. And then if you even need more detail, you can get our slides and frequently asked questions and links by clicking here.